Hello, Hello and welcome. <laughs> Gosh, it's going to be one of those. I'm waiting for you. You looked frozen. That's why I. How long can I look frozen and then jump into it at the same time? Uh, Hello and welcome to Future Commerce, (laughs) the podcast about the next generation of commerce. I'm Brian. I'm Philip. And we got some breaking news. But before we do, uh, hey, I'm just going to bring over the tone from our census emails that we've been sending out here uh, since the beginning of the year. I set the tone. I didn't ask you permission, by the way. I should have probably done that. <laughs> I wanted to set the tone for the beginning of the year, Brian, is that relentless optimism was going to be the drum we're banging for 2023. You can't keep a good dog down. Uh, I feel like CES was pretty optimistic. The NRF Big Show was pretty optimistic. And with that in mind, wow, there's a lot of layoffs happening right now <laughs> in, a of, in a lot of places. Oh, we sit here laughing about layoffs, but it's only in the context. <laughs> oh, yeah, gosh. only in the context of uh, of of us being optimistic. I'm still optimistic about the year. Uh, there are some weird things about these layoffs. I mean, the fact that like every major tech company is laying people off, except for Apple. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you can't help but think that there's a little bit of an excuse scenario going on here. Oh, like everyone's laying off. Now's our time to get rid of people it is very hard to fire people i can't help but think that there's a lot of like low performer culling that's happening right now however that does not feel true for the google layoff to me uh that that was kind of an outlier in all of this because my understanding and 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 this is both you know what i've what i've read about but also anecdotal is that they're they let go a lot of high performers, longtime employees, and people who have been recently promoted. Uh, Hmm. That that is weird. I don't know if it is. I don't think it's weird. weird. I'll tell you what I think it is. I think it's an existential shift of focus. There are two things that we have to kind of keep in mind. Uh, One is uh, this thing I've been calling, which you heard in the last episode, crossing the Rubicon, which is people just... I think there's apathy around the things that we're used to and people are tired of things and people have just decided that it's, it's Google's time to be disrupted. And they're looking for reasons that Google should be disrupted, not because of a lack of quality in the service, not because the world can't find, you know, the information at the world's fingertips, which was always Google's mission. Google has organized the world's information. They have done that. They, they did what they set out to accomplish. I think that there is a certain kind of a person in our industry who is ready for the challenger. And last year they were beating the drum saying TikTok is going to, TikTok search, right? Especially among Gen Z will displace the Google search for the next generation. People will go to TikTok first, which by the way, I have a whole thesis on that. I, I feel like I haven't gone into in depth in the podcast. I mean, everybody wants... Google to die. That's what it sounds like. Everyone's like, <laughs> they're calling for this is the Google killer. Like everybody just kind of wants everything's them a Google to killer. lose. Yeah. <laughs> but in reality, and they are, it's because it's a David and Goliath scenario. You know, yeah. Google won. Um, de facto, Google and Apple sort of own a giant part of, you know, of, of tech. So Google sort of retrenching, there's, you know, conversations that Sundar Pichai is, you know, personally heading the uh, Google Duplex initiative, which is their chat GPT killer, theoretically. You know, there's a, a whole uh, large language model which has been being developed for years now inside of Google, which they have yet to pull back the curtain on. So much so that we've reported off in here on the show, but if you're just listening for the first time or you're catching up, that uh, Blake LeMoyne, a researcher at Google, uh, went to you know, as U.S. Senator's office late late last year in uh, 2022 and claimed that it had, you know, this this language model they had developed had become sentient and was self-aware and that they have created an AI that is terrifying and powerful and it should be stopped at all costs. You know, this is theoretically Google's answer to the open AI initiative, which Microsoft has aligned itself around. So yeah, there's battle lines being drawn. People want to take down the giant. Um, So it doesn't feel 
all that inexplicable to me, Brian. Layoffs are refocusing where the priorities are in, in one part of the business to future-proof itself for the next generation. That's how I would explain it. Yeah, that makes sense. Because it's not going to come through live streaming <laughs> or merch sales on YouTube because that's not where the, the levers are. I think that's where a lot of the commerce think- analyst industrial complex wanted <laughs> the growth to come from. But that's not where the growth is going to come from. I mean, I think that long term, you're absolutely right. You know, there's monetization to be had for existing products, and Google's done a great job of that over the years. Let's let's be clear, like Google <laughs> value <laughs> extraction, <laughs> and, and I think they're going to probably continue to do that. But I think that they're looking ahead and they're like, oh wow, actually this this may be the actual Google killer, and our competitor Microsoft just invested a lot of money in it, and I think Microsoft. Probably similar scenario where they, you know, they laid off ten thousand. Uh, another big layoff. Uh, they're they're refocusing. They, they did that like the same week they announced like a hundred million dollars investment in OpenAI. Like refocusing is probably the the term. The one thing that kind of caught me off guard again about the Google pieces though is I've seen other big tech companies, you know, tech co- companies like Adobe and others. They usually do a really good job of moving high value individuals, individuals that they see as really talented, people that have just been promoted or that have added a lot of value in other places. They move them around in the company. Mm. And so to and and so that was the the Google one. I I do think there might have been some actual cost cutting happening. There was there was reports of of people who were earning million dollars annually that got cut. Um, oh, I'm sure they'll be okay. Uh, I, I'm sure they'll be okay too. That's not my point. My point <laughs> is saying like, I, I actually think Google was going to town when it came to, uh, oh, yeah. well, let's not forget that. I think, you know, there was, there was a report in the wall street journal that, you know, Google had almost doubled its workforce since the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, this is just a, and it's like any, any cuts that are being made in tech right now are just slightly pulling back from the explosion in workforce additions that they have made over the last two and a half, three years. So I, I wouldn't be sounding the alarm. Do you know what we also have at the same time is a historically low unemployment rate in the United right. States of America. <laughs> yeah. So um, and that's even even notwithstanding the fact that, you know, nobody wants to work in fast food anymore. It's all going to be machines and automations. I have to go to a kiosk. I can't find the hamburger with no cheese because my kid hates cheese. I have to stand at the kiosk for five, six, seven minutes staring at a yes. you know menu screen of options. Oh. Not, it, like it is markedly a worse customer experience, but that's the world that we all chose. So this is the world we all have to live in now. Um, and we still have historically low unemployment. So I don't know. I I, uh, I, 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 by the way, I talked to someone that went to the McDonald's that's fully automated and he said it was terrible because I was, love it. There was no, even, there wasn't even attendance. Give there. us fewer reasons in this world to go to McDonald's. I don't have any <laughs> problem with that. I, uh, I think you're dead on uh, another really good point here is that the, these companies have taken some, some serious knocks on the chin from the street this past year. The, it, the stock market loves layoffs. Like, oh, yeah, is, no. And it's all factored in. I, yeah. I, I, this is all, you know, it's a lot of consternation over, you know, what I think the all in podcast would call surplus elites. We got a lot of people making surplus a lot more money elites, than yeah. they probably deserve. Um, I was probably one of them at one point in time. And now I run a podcast and that's okay. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're, you know, I think. Let's come back to commerce, because I think this is a really important point to make. Why does all of this matter? I think we can tie it up. What what really matters is a lot of the things that have been repeated as the next generation defining commerce experiences are just going to flat out turn out to be wrong or untrue or wishful thinking. And in particular, it's what are what were the the major growth levers that we were going to anticipate in the next 10 years? Let's look at what the analyst industrial complex said. If you look at McKinsey and you look at Gartner and you look at Forrester and you look at Coresight and you look at what other analysts have predicted around e-commerce growth and retail growth, they would tell you it's experiential, it's metaverse, it's AR, it's VR, it is uh, cryptocurrency, it's Web3 experiences. And it turns out that maybe none of that's true. They would tell you it's uh, you know, Far East uh, uh, shopping experiences, it's conversational commerce, super it's apps. text message based, it's super apps, it's live stream shopping, it's influencer. And while all of those have some f- 
some facet of truth to them in that they influence the way that we want to engage. They tell you it's social commerce and that you're going to buy stuff direct through Instagram and that's going to happen. TikTok's going to launch fulfillment centers in the United States. And all of this is subject to, well, yeah, if that's what the consumer wants, but it turns out that's not what the consumer wants. Consumer wants none of those things. Um, no one's radar on no one's radar was a conversational, you know, chat bot that writes your job application for you. Um, and I think that, you know, this, this uh, democratization and consumer access of AI and language generation is going to have a material impact on the way that we buy things because we are already seeing, we had a conversation, Brian, um, at a future commerce salon that we had in New York last week uh, with a CEO of a major fashion house saying that within two weeks of getting access to GPT-3, they were using it in production. I've never seen the adoption of technology and albeit like freemium technology that has made its way into in front of consumers at such a clip. And not a single analyst could have told you that in the last few years because everyone was bought into a hype cycle. Um, by the way, one that I have said was patently false for yeah, a couple of years now. For years, you've been. You've I'm been on record that saying <laughs> yeah. social commerce is a farce. Uh, live stream shopping. Live is stream dead. shopping is a farce. It's <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> and uh, and I'm okay with you know with being definitive and and very clear that these are wish these are wish fulfillment. Just because something's happening in one part of the world doesn't mean it's destined to come to another. It really depends on how the American consumer, at least in our perspective, because that's where we're based and that's, you know, the primary audience we serve. It's like how they adopt technology. And those are much longer adoption cycles than I think that anybody is prepared to accept because it doesn't, it doesn't make for like a really sexy annual report and trends report. That's why. Exactly. Well, what, what's actually happening is now finally spurring me to read the book that I've been wanting to read for a while, which is archetypes, <laughs> archetypesjournal.com. <laughs> That's the one you've been. I mean, no. I, I don't have to read that one. I wrote it with you. Like, <laughs> that was a, uh, but I actually, I have read archetypes over and over now. Uh, it's, it's so good. <laughs> um, what's, what's the actual book you were going to reference? Sorry. Uh, for the, the human plug. use of human beings because chat GPT is crazy. <laughs> Um, the, I think the, there's a lot of discussion right now about like what our role in, in, in work is going to be. And, and there's a, actually, it's a lot of talk in, in the human use of human beings and some of other, Nor, of, of Norbert Wiener's books that are, is, is focused on automation and display, like displacement of jobs, actually. Um, and also, like where humans and machines need to interact, and where humans and humans need to interact, and where machines to machines need to interact. <laughs> and so there's there's a lot of like thought around, and I'm still in the middle of the book. I I'm only like 20 pages in right now, so uh, I'll have to give a full. It's always the best later, way to, to, <laughs> yeah. to give a full book. Yeah, exactly. Um, I I'm actively learning about the the role that we played in and, and, and actually um, Wiener heavily influenced Marshall McLuhan, who we've referenced pretty heavily lately. Um, I have to make a public apology. <laughs> I want to give a plenty of space so that everybody can <laughs> let that sink in for a second. I I'm realizing now, and it took six years to do it. So I apologize. Um, you're like way out in front on a bunch of stuff so much so that I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Stop talking about it. Um, but it turns out that after about six months of marinating in the bigger ideas, I've like, I finally kind of come around to things you're, you're on to some really wild things. Um, I have to turn our audience on before we come back to human use of humans. Is that the name of the human title? use of human beings? Yeah. <laughs> human beings. Okay. I want to come back to that because I have a, a lot to say. Um, but you wrote a piece called quantum yeet, which Still don't love the title. Um, I said we should change it. I, I, everyone was like, oh, it's too late. It's too good. It's fine. And I was like, I don't think this it title is gets good. Attention. <laughs> I sat, I sat in a meeting last week with, uh, one of our, our listeners, uh, and, and, uh, a reader of ours, uh, of the newsletter, uh, who said his favorite piece for the last couple months 
was quantum yeet and i almost fell out of my chair because i told you at the time like i just don't get this dude i and i'm a person who reads quantum mechanics books for fun um but i just didn't understand the points that you were making and it took me a little while but he explained it back to me in a way that i felt like was really beneficial for me to understand and it also kind of showed me that you know it's really hard to be your audience surrogate when you're a content creator it's like really hard to put yourself in the position of the audience because I just wasn't, I wasn't jamming on it. Um, but he had this really great way of explaining like the customer journey is not linear. And if you just use that phrase right there, this is a, by the way, this is like, if you're not onto this stuff in the future commerce, you know, oeuvre, um, you should be because the big, big, big ideas usually make their way into our larger pieces. And we're, you know, thinking, pretty heavily right now about our visions report this year and what that looks like. Um, so it's all influencing, right? But he said the customer journey is not linear. From the inspiration to purchase something to the actual fulfillment of the purchase uh, and then the gratification you receive from it, you are actually traversing along many retailers' timelines. So if Amazon were to interrogate the purchase that you're looking to make, they see a discrete start and stop, but that is not the true start and stop. Right? They see your shopping for it and your purchase of it, but that wasn't where the original inspiration was. And part of our jobs as marketers is to try to make sense of this journey and to attribute that journey. But you probably shopped maybe at Target for the same thing, or maybe on Etsy, and maybe you asked some friends about it. In reality, you existed across a multitude of marketing funnels at one time. It is quantum superpositions, and it all has to do with the point of reference. So without using the word quantum, a given marketer from their point of reference has one perspective of your journey. If you were to put yourself in God mode to see the entirety of the journey, you'll see that you're actually moving between multiple timelines. That is quantum. And when Kyle re-explained this to me, I'm like, I finally understand it. Why doesn't Kyle write that piece, Brian? I don't know. Let's have Kyle. Let's just <laughs> have Kyle, Kyle write for us. Kyle, let's just have you Kyle write for, write us? for us. From I don't even on. know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I love it. Well, it's a. I, I think it's really freaking brilliant. And um. And so, rather than make fun of you about Marshall McLuhan, I won't do it again. Rather than <laughs> ra rather than beat you over the head with the word quantum, I'm just going to apologize and say, Oh, sheesh. I haven't gotten uh, it, but now I think I get it. There, the thing is, I think there's the world the world of McLuhan's a lot deeper than I've even touched. And actually, the world of quantum is going to be <laughs> also bigger than the, 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 these are words that have worked their way into our or quantum is something that's, you know, uh, it's, it's a concept that's worked its way into our concepts as a society. Quantum mania. The third Antiman oh, gosh, is that's coming out soon, now. right? Uh, yeah, but I think I think that they're they're actually reflective of like bigger ideas that are working their way into pop culture that are preparing us for how we have to approach the world coming up, and they're uh, desensitizing us yes. to the coming zombie apocalypse that we're all about to uh, encounter <laughs> i don't know about saying. zombie apocalypse although uh watching the last of us I, that seems likely now <laughs> so uh, let, let's i want to put a bow on this because the human use of human beings you you touched on a a subject about the displacement of jobs in particular probably marketing jobs um and maybe in particular content creation and creative roles um and it's funny because we just mentioned the McDonald's kiosk. Uh, the McDonald's kiosk displaces a job in the economy that arguably very few people wanted to begin with. Correct. Um, they yep. were hard to staff. They were hard to retain. Uh, almost nobody wanted to work in that role. And those, I mean, entry level roles in an economy are necessary and vital, and I don't want to disparage them, but in a hundred year old business like McDonald's at some point, very few people want that job to begin with. I have to believe that very few people want the job of SEO writer. Like right. no one wants to write a 6,000 word recipe blog that is, is just right. laid in with, you know, a bunch of SEO garbage and jargon. You don't really want that job. Is it a job? Yes. But nobody really wants that job. They have to do that job. So this is where I think we're going. The McDonald's kiosk was probably the labor of 
hundreds of industrial designers who had to create electronics and touchable interfaces, and probably dozens of interface designers and graphic artists and integration specialists and agencies and installers, right? Think about the hundreds and thousands of people and labor that went into creating and maintaining and, and updating. And there, it's more knowledge and information work to create a McDonald's kiosk. This is what's going to happen for the SEO blogger is that the new role is prompt engineer, right? We have people yep. who understand the inputs and outputs and can write prompts for your SEO copywriting engine powered by GPT who, and maybe not just even SEO, maybe it's pricing and merchandising strategies. Maybe it's your promotions calendar. Maybe it's your follow-up emails and your abandoned cart, you know, campaigns and your welcome series. And these are all things that are sort of rote, you know, rinse and repeat playbooks that get implemented over and over. That is not exactly engaging copy or even intellectually stimulating work that almost that everybody needs, but almost nobody really wants to do on a given base on a, no, this is exactly right. In fact, I would argue that like, remember back when Google used to be like this weird mix of like black and gray hat, like just the weirdest, like the weirdest industry sort of like opened up as a result of, of Google search marketing. Yes. The business that was actually people trying to figure out and satisfy machines, algorithms, right? It was people's exploration of all the possible ways that they exploitation. could- Exploitation. Exploitation. Not explore. I mean, exploration. it is exploration. It's exploitation, right? Of, right, but they were trying to, to like right. basically like hit every possible way that the algorithm could absorb information and mm. game and, and, and figure it out, like figure out where, where they could like best- hit at that algorithm. Now, the, the the thing is the algorithm's intent by its creators wasn't necessarily to have an algorithm that people were just going to kind of like blast around. They were trying to get an outcome out of it. And yeah, to make you cry on LinkedIn. Yes. So that you get a number of likes and reshares. Bingo. Right. The thing is, this was always best suited to be accomplished by a machine. Like we've been, we as humans have been trying to accomplish jobs that are better done by machines. I just mentioned machine to machine communication, like all the jobs that are best done by machines should be pursued as jobs that are done by machines. Um, <laughs> There's, you remember I, we've referenced it a couple of times now, but there was an episode um, with Brian Romilly uh, Hundreds of episodes ago. I mean, it's many years ago this on the is 19 podcast. Nineteen and twenty, episode nineteen, episode twenty. Yep. Uh, there was a uh, what was he was talking about? He had like voice computers that were all talking to each other in a yeah. Closed he had room. he'd written a series of prompts that would spur additional prompts between. I think it was Google and Alexa, or or maybe it was just Alexa and Alexa. And he said that he had them in like a closet, like barricaded, just prompting prompting and prompting um like which they were is, having a they were having a conversation between each other right is yep. what he was is what <laughs> is what he claimed and i thought it was far fetched but that's like that was 5 years ago maybe 6 and it's not so far fetched anymore um i just looked for it on the site i can't find it it's probably there it's episode 19 episode 20 i hope you have 3 and a half hours to dedicate your life to those two episodes cuz it's a long it's a long haul worth a but listen he, though he outlined, you know, if there's anyone that's a futurist that we know, like a true futurist, um, it's Romilly. We should get him back on the show. We really should. I think we've said yeah. this a couple of times. We need like a Tim Ferriss style, like five hour block for that guy. That's what we need. We should just create a new property just for Romilly. Just, <laughs> just, just, we do it all in it's like a perpetual 90 a hour <laughs> exploration. <laughs> we should um, write, uh, we should have him interact with Ch Chat GPT and then publish that. As the, as the, uh, I would watch review. it. I would watch it. I watch people cut sand on YouTube for crying out loud. I'd listen to Brian Romilly chat with the, uh, with the computer. You do a lot of chat GPT. Prompts. I do. You're very good at it. You're very good at leading, leading the witness as you, as you will. And that, like, yeah. that's, that's how you it's, it's how make it, it work. So actually I've been on to this for a little yeah. while. I, I want to kind of paint the picture of the future that I think that we're, we're in because this human use of human beings 
displacement of jobs. I heard this already once two decades ago when I got into e-commerce. The promise of e-commerce, I've said this so many times on this show, but the promise of e-commerce was that we were going to have cheaper goods available faster because we are removing the unnecessary parts of labor and infrastructure in the retail purchase process, which means it's a better outcome for the consumer. So win-win, we are removing middlemen. We were going to take away the air-conditioned showroom because who needs that? Well, that's only open a certain number of hours and it costs a lot of money to staff and then you have to change the window dressing because people get bored. And you had all of these encumbrances to growing a retail footprint, retail business that included heat and gas and cooling and staffing. It was like none of that's necessary anymore because you can just shop 24-7 online, amazon.com, right? Everything you want for cheaper. But it turns out that's not the case. E-commerce is nothing but middlemen. It's laden with middlemen. In fact, 90% of the interactions on Twitter that I see are, how many middlemen can you sign up for on your Shopify site today? It's the 16 apps you need to run your business. It's the, how many middlemen can you pack between yourself and the customer that can all become margin extractive and like reduce your profitability so that you can keep up with whatever fad or fashion is at the time. I have heard this once before, Brian Ling. I feel like that's where we're heading again because yes, we are going to remove, we're removing the copywriter and the SEO analyst and we are removing you know some of the CX people But what we're going to add as a result are prompt engineers, people that write briefs, people that write exacting detail about the website, you know, visuals that need to come (laughs) out the other end. And you're just moving one job from one place in the economy that has become so competitive, right, that wages have gone down and the numbers of people that fulfill those roles and the expectations and the frequency that we see those roles and the availability of those roles has multiplied. And we're going to get rid of those. And we're going to move them into prompt engineers and machine vision specialists and people who are really good at certain visual styles and coaxing that out of mid journey. Like we're, Coaxing we're, being the right word. And all we're doing is we're creating a new set of skills that has the same effect and output, but is a as yeah, I don't think it's more middlemen. It's not the same effect in output. So that's that's the one place where I think I would like sort of disagree. The output's actually going to be better because mm. we're using machines to accomplish things that we are not very good at. It took us 20 years to figure out how to get the SEO algorithm algorithm right. And that was due to like people poking at it for in thousands upon thousands of people poking mm-hmm. at that algorithm for years and years and years. Those jobs should be done by machines. And so it's the outcome. The outcome is like, I think you're out. The outcome, what you're saying is we're not losing jobs. There's going to be jobs. It's just the the things that. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's going to still be jobs. There's going to be more software. Yeah. And you're going to pay for more crap. Where are you going to manage all these prompts? Right. Right. You're going to have them a prompt manager. Like we need a PRM. That's what we need. You're going to, the enterprise is going to have a prompt relationship management tool and Correct. you're going to store all your prompts in there. And that's going to go into your machine assisted output visual management tool. It's like all of your brand visuals are going to go into there. It doesn't fit in a PIM. It doesn't fit in a CRM. It doesn't really fit in into uh, your asset and dam management so, stuff. It's going to so be let me other ask you a question, Philip. You got what more if- software already and we haven't even, we're, we're 28 minutes into an episode you're talking it's, about the progress machine. Where does the progress machine lead to? That's, yeah. I think, kind of what you're asking is like, always. what's the it's a, it's point basically of all a this? Rule. It's a rule. You will always have, there will always be a middle layer of infrastructure that's required and a middle <laughs> layer of management to manage that infrastructure that's required. In five years' time, we're going to look back and say, wow, this didn't actually reduce any amount of like capital input. It actually just moved it to a different place in the economy to but, a different style of job. But for the people that are out in front of it, there is an arbitrage, There's an arbitrage opportunity, uh, opportunity right now. That's yes. exactly what it is. So that's what people that what, listen to the show are all after. They all want to know how they can use it in their business so they can get some efficiency or arbitrage right now. But I have never seen technology adopted at this rate or become so recognizable. So this is the other thing. How the flip side is adapt. if you don't adopt it, is you, you get left behind. <laughs> you may get left behind, but there's always going to be someone who's going to be like, I can recognize machine-generated essays and machine-generated output, 
so quickly. Like I'm already getting hip to it. It it took me a couple months. Like it was extremely impressive, like a magic trick at the beginning. And then I realized after working with chat GPT for two months, I'm like, I can, there's a cadence to this. You can, you can kind of pick it up. You can sort of catch it now. Although if you have a good, as you said, like prompt engineer and prompt editor, like a human partner, they're, like the, it's oh, it will be indistinguishable. It's because almost it will always be human output. What was the what's the f- there's a often repeated uh, not Neville Chamberlain or someone said at some point like you know <laughs> forgive the 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 length of my letter I you know if I had had more time it'd be much shorter I, I if that was I butchered that quote but that's oh but that's yeah that's a good quote so that's how I feel about chat GPT um, and other machine assisted outputs. Now it's like people are so impressed by the length of prose that they just take it all and they shove it all together. They'll ask seven prompts. They'll get a hundred and you know, I don't know. They'll get a thousand words or 1500 words. They'll just mangle them all together and they'll try to glue the seams together and say, look at this thing I just wrote. Yeah. But nobody like, I don't Ugh. have the attention span to read that. Never mind, write it. And that's part of the telltale sign of this output at the moment is the volume of the output is the thing that people are sort of clued into as like, I can make a thousand word post, but in reality, it requires it requires a human to, to output a 400 word post. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And actually condensed writing is, is like one of the most difficult skills of all time. Yeah. Like say that, but shorter, say that, but shorter is like the, the, (laughs) Uh, the thing yeah. that would have killed Dickens, but is important in, especially in business writing. So I like, I, I, yeah. I, I, it's interesting. Like what will be the markers of when well, something is written by here's a, a couple things, a marker right now of what's not generated by chat GPT is anything that has recency. So, you know, memeified language, things that are happening right now on Twitter, um, even using sort of like Gen Z slang, uh, it seems really hard to get the machine to output that sort of thing. So there's like the, if you know, you know, quality and sort of referencing current events, those are things that it just can't do at the moment. And so if you want to have this authenticity layer, maybe dressing up, you know, the machine output with a bunch of, you know, although I feel like there's ways around that. There's ways around that though, because like, especially with chat GPT, you can give it context and feed it information. Yeah. It theoretically <laughs> will tell you that it has no knowledge of events, you know, after, you know, middle of 2022 or, or right. early 2022. So anyway, let, let's come back to one of the things that I'm trying to, to tease out here, which is the future of commerce. I don't think that the, the, the necessarily that the channels that we shop in right now are are going to be like dramatically different in the next year or two. But I want to look forward as to what might be possible in the next five years. We talked about this at our New York salon. Um, so you had posed this question in the Quantum Yeet article about needing new levels of compute and storage to handle the world's information in an explosion of information as as we enter into the next age. And it's not just about the capture of new data creation and information for you, you were talking about context. Also capturing the context in which that information was created is important for later analysis so that we can have this godlike ability to know what the customer's journey truly was across all these sales. So the data about the data, about the data, data, about about the data, 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 right. It's a rabbit hole, right? So um, it's very meta. So, but here I'm going to, I, 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 kind of posited to you, well, what if we thought about this differently? It doesn't have to be quantum computing, but what if, uh, and, and maybe this is like, let's go down this hole. I love it. (laughs) So the, the reason that computing has to follow Moore's law, uh, which Moore's law was an exponential, uh, ever increasing climb in computing power since the 1970s and sort of that transistor density doubles every 18 months. This was the, (laughs) like, it's it's wild that after 35, 40 years, it still holds, but that's kind of where we are. And so we've had to create these engineering capabilities to kind of hold true to this need of ever more computing power. Um, We're now kind of at theoretical limits in that 
we can only get transistors so close together before we're on a molecular scale. So we're right. at like three nanometer processing at the moment. Like we're kind of at the physical limit of a silicon transistor. We can't go any further. So your posit was quantum is the next realm. But I, I have another theory. Here's what I think could be possible. We build human interfaces to build computers. So it needs to be human understandable. So right now, follow you're gonna have to follow this journey and it's gonna be a little bit of a dissertation but here we go um the closest thing that runs on a cpu is something called machine code and machine code typically to be most performant is written in very almost human illegible code it's assembler it's something that's extremely low level it doesn't need to be interpreted by an operating system it's literally running on the processor it's code that's runnable by a transistor and instruction set for a CPU. Okay. On top of that, we have operating systems which handle all kinds of generalized compute functions. It's RAM and memory management, it's storage and hard drive storage, it's ethernet, you know, connectivity and data packets and and error correction. It's, you know, there is right now in your CPU a function which is doing error correction for gamma rays that are floating through the atmosphere right now that are coming from you know, from outside distant galaxies and supernova that happened billions of years ago. It is fascinating the kinds of things that your computer does that you're not even aware of doing. But a lot of that is written on human interfaces. That's what your operating system is doing at this exact moment. On top of that, you have applications that that's written in C, right? Very performant code, but it's human written for human consumption. On top of that, you have applications which are written in C++. Your web browser is written in C++. It's extremely performant, but it's written in human legible code. The website that you're accessing is talking to a web server, also written in C++, written in human understandable code. On top of that, we have HTML and CSS and JavaScript. And now we have WebAssembly. And on top of that, we have uh, visual display languages. And we have uh, JavaScript is actually kind of terse. So we've created things like React. And we have uh, data interchange formats like GraphQL. And all of this, all these layers upon layers upon layers upon layers, is meant for human consumption and has an efficiency cost associated with it. So what if none of that's necessary? And what if you're just talking to a computer and you say, I need a web page that shows you the Archetypes Journal that you can buy right now at archetypesjournal.com. And I want that web page to sell things to people and I want it to go to my bank account and I can, I can in exacting detail give every single instruction of how the visual design and how the interchange works between my bank what if all of that runs at the lowest level of the CPU? It doesn't have to run on an operating system. It's a purpose-built app that runs as close to bare metal as possible. We recapture 40 years, four generations worth of compute power back to humanity. Of, work, of workarounds. Basically, of workarounds. It's all workarounds. Because, it's all layers on layers. Because those are jobs that should be done there should be one job for humans to interact with machines and the rest of it should be machine to machine interaction. I think yeah. you've nailed it. Like, but that's, we don't need quantum. We can buy ourselves another few decades of Moore's law by just recapturing all of the spare compute power. Yeah. The quantum, around. The, the quantum computing becomes a, a future generation problem. <laughs> yeah. And, and we can continue down this path of just, you know, human interface connection data storage even, is still the issue actually i think that, still, is, that is a problem yeah <laughs> well we could cover that in a future episode of future commerce uh brian any last thoughts to kind of wrap us up my gosh well let me just read you something that was from 1964 really quickly um and i'm uh this is norbert reiner and in a different book actually that i bought of his and he says um he was talking about like like how good can this actually get like, and he was talking about how like language models and he was forecasting like translation of languages from one language to another. And he said like, if you can get some like a computer to take a language, translation it into another language and to another language and then back to the original language, you've, you've, you've won, right? You've, you've, you've won the battle because yep. that's about as complex as it gets. And he said that it doesn't look like in the near term, and again, this is written in 1964, that we're going to be able to get to a point where you can run that circle in full 
based off of just a, a tr- training an algorithm to do it. And so he said, it seems to me that the best hope of a reasonably satisfactory mechanical translation is to replace a pure mechanism, at least at first, by a mechanical human system involving as critic and expert human translator to teach it by exercises as a school teacher instructs human pupils. Hmm. Perhaps at some later stage, the memory of the machine may have absorbed enough human instruction to dispense with later human participation, except perhaps for a refresher course now and then. And this way, the machine would develop linguistic maturity. I just think about, I just think this is dead on for the way that we have to interact with chat GPT at this moment. And we, as we look ahead, uh, this is interaction with human is the training model for how for for how AI will evolve into what it needs to be to become what you just talked about. Like it won't be able to do it until it spends enough time interacting with humanity. Um, and we're going to have I, to lead it there. We're going to have to leave it right there. Uh, there's so much. I have so, so many more things I want to say. Uh, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Future Commerce, uh, maybe far future commerce at this point. Uh, we have more episodes of this podcast and all future commerce properties at futurecommerce.fm. And if you want to stay up to date on, hey, when our next salon is going to be, uh, we'd love to have you in attendance. And uh, we're working on some really fun things right now. We'd love for you to be involved. Join our community at futurecommerce.fm slash subscribe. We're in your inbox once, twice, hey, maybe three times a week on a great week. Uh, And we'd love to get to know you and uh, have you join our community of futurists. Thank you so much for listening to Future Commerce. Thanks. Thanks.